Vanita here, ready to go through the word with you. We are in Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to be covering verses 1 through 14, basically half of this chapter this week. So um, it's exciting that we made our way to chapter 9 now. Chapter 9 will compare the Old Covenant uh, sacrifices um, against Christ's sacrifice, revealing which is greater. Can you guess which is greater? I think you can. <laughs> so verses 1 through 10 will outline the characteristics of the Old Covenant, and verses 11 through 14 outline the New Covenant we have in Christ. I've broken this section, this portion of Scripture, into four segments. Number one is the ancient tabernacle. Number two is the service of the Levitical uh, high priest. Number three is the old covenant was symbolic. And number four, Jesus or Christ has come. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come and teach us that you would give us comprehension of this passage, more and more understanding of what you're trying to tell us. And Lord, that spiritual personal touch of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and ways to apply this that would be meaningful to us. Because, Lord, you wrote these scriptures for our edification, that we could be built up in our faith. And so I pray it would build us up in our faith. Um, I thank you, Lord, for my husband and his help in the portion of creating a PowerPoint. And bless him, Lord, as he serves you so faithfully in these ways and supports me. So we, we give this study to you, Lord. Bless it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so we're starting with number one, the ancient tabernacle. I'm going to be reading verses one through five, and I'm in the new um, King James Version. Okay, then indeed, then the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Verse 5, And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Very good. The tabernacle of the Old Covenant is not to be viewed as worthless. As we look forward, you know, to this new covenant and we're living in this new covenant, it's not like we're meant to despise uh, the things that God had ordained in the past. God says in verse 1, it, he points out that um, it provided divine services or ceremonies that God himself ordained and put into place uh, for the people of uh, Israel, that they would have a means to worship him. That's important. So its value was temporary, and that is a critical point here, and it has been for a while. It's temporary, but yes, it was necessary until the time of Christ. So in verses 2 through 5, the author lists the furnishings that um, prepared the tabernacle service. And God so beautifully designed the tabernacle and its furnishings that they would present to us a clear picture of the Messiah. And they were meant to preach the gospel of the future Messiah, Jesus. Verse 5 says, of these things we cannot now speak of in, uh, in detail. And the author understood that his readers, um, they had detailed knowledge of the tabernacle. So it was unnecessary to pile on the particulars. Um, and he did, in fact, even leave out some of the furnishings. He didn't cover every last detail. He painted that picture. And he was preparing to make a comparison to the old covenant and the new covenant. So Though they were very keen <laughs> on the knowledge of the tabernacle, are we? One commentator pointed out that there are only two chapters in the Bible that speak about the creation of the world and 50 chapters that speak about the tabernacle. So it's that important, particularly since the tabernacle contains pictures of Christ. So let's stop and take a uh, uh, look at a few of the features of the tabernacle and how they preach the gospel of Christ, the Messiah. 
there's so much that could be said about all of this. I can only give you a thimble full. But yet I want you to get a, a feel for the symbolism and the details that are there, especially if you've never been familiar with it before. I will not be covering every detail in any way, but I hope that it will bless you. So the tabernacle had three main parts. First, there was an outer court, which was entered through a single gate. Then there was the holy place. You'd walk in and then you'd come to what's called the holy place. And then lastly, there was the holy, uh, most holy place, which we a lot of times call the Holy of Holies. Um, so let's take a little closer look again. Inside the outer court, you walk through the gate, you come into the, what's called the outer court. Um, there's the brazen altar of sacrifice. Then you come to the laver or uh, bronze basin. And then you would see the skin covered rectangular building of the tabernacle proper that contained um, the holy place and the most holy place. Okay, the furnishings in the outer court. You've walked in and now you're in this outer court open area. Uh, everything in that court symbolized salvation and the cleansing of sin. Now, where did Jesus accomplish salvation? and the cleansing of sin. Well, he accomplished it on the earth, didn't he? Now, the outer court thus is um, is the out, is outside of God's presence. We're not into the most holy or the uh, holies of holies yet. We're on the outside of it. And so the very fact that, that um, these were in the outer court is uh, men, means that it's um, accessible to all people. People were all able to come into that portion. And that is a picture of Christ in itself. Christ in the world, openly revealing himself before men. And we'll get even more specific. Let's look at the gate or the door. The tabernacle was a very large tent. It was 150 feet long. It was 75 feet wide. And there, were, there was only one gate on the east side, one gate, and the gate was 30 feet wide and seven and a half feet uh, high, and many people could enter through it. Exodus 27, 16 says, for the gate of the court there, there um, shall be, I'm so sorry, for the gate of the court, uh, shall there shall be a screen 20 cubits long, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, um, made by a weaver. It shall have four pillars and four sockets. That's four pillars and sockets help it stand up on one hand, but also this would be carried as they travel. Now, this is a picture of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way. And he also said, I am the door. How many doors are there to God? Well, there's one, the one door, Jesus Christ. But you may say, well, that is a very narrow and ridiculous view. Surely there are many ways to God and many means to God. People don't like to be told that there's only one way or one door. So in their imaginations, they create many ways to God. But those doors will fail them. As I shared last week, this new covenant, it's not a covenant that you can make bargains with God. It's not a covenant where you can make up rules and add to it or take away from anything that God has said. One way, one door, one possible means of salvation and forgiveness and heaven. One, Jesus Christ. And then we have the brazen altar. We've gone through the, the door and now we see the brazen altar. Uh, when the common Israelites approached the, uh, the tabernacle, and with their sacrifice, they would pass through that gate and they would find uh, that between him and the tabernacle structure stood an altar with a priest waiting beside it, that brazen altar. This uh, piece of furniture isn't mentioned by the author of Hebrews chapter 9. Well, it was made of acacia wood and it was overlaid with bronze. Um, it was seven and a half feet square. So it was a large altar, and it's the largest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. 
a, a brass grate covered it on the top and coals were beneath it. You could really see this as a giant barbecue because this is what they were going to do. They were going to sacrifice the animals and then we're going to lay them on the uh, under, you know, on top of that grate where the coals and the flames would be there and they would be cooked. So the sacrifice would be placed on top of the grate. On all four corners of the um, altar, there were horns, horns. And that was where the animals would be bound when they were going to be sacrificed. Uh, there were two poles inserted into the bronze rings um, to carry the altar when traveling. And then once the brazen altar was set up, it was consecrated. And with a little ceremony, they would consecrate that. And that consecration would make whatever touched it holy. The brazen altar is a perfect picture of Jesus Christ, illustrating the basics of atonement for sin. Let's think about this. There's a strong metal, bronze, that covered it. And bronze is often associated with judgment. Bronze symbolizes the ability to endure. Jesus took the punishment of our sins upon himself. He alone had the power to endure the fiery judgment of the holiness of God. The brazen altar stood open to receive an innocent sacrifice for the guilt of the transgressor. Can you imagine taking one of your very own animals and bringing it to walking it in, putting it there, and knowing that it had to be put to death to cover your sins? That is a heavy scene, a heavy scene indeed. And so one life was given for the other. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness. The Israelites were to approach the brazen altar with humility and submission um, to receive the ministry of reconciliation, being made right with God. The picture is that we can't approach God's presence um, without atonement for sin. We're sinners and he is holy and there's no bringing us together without atonement for our sin. This ancient altar uh, pointed ahead to Calvary's cross and Christ's substitutionary sacrifice for sin, where all who would touch it would be made holy. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Well, after you would come to the brazen altar, then move forward, you would see the bronze laver. The laver was also made of acacia wood and it was also covered in bronze. Interestingly, the bronze to make the laver was surrendered to the Lord by the service, for the Lord's service by the Israelite women. It was the, the bronze that they had. It was very interesting. You see, the Egyptians developed the technique of polishing the brass so that you could see your reflection in it. And so while captive there, the Israelite women had purchased a large quantity of these looking glasses. Women have not changed a bit, have they? The gla looking glasses have only got better and we only have many more of them probably throughout our houses. Mirrors offered, often served as a tool of self-gratification, but a deeper look a deeper look reveals the need of a marred and sinful soul, the need for holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So there were no measurements for the labor, um, just as there is no end to the holiness God provides for his people. For he said, be holy as I am holy, 1 Peter 1, 16. He was the only one who could make us holy. The labor basin where the priests washed their hands and feet um, before and during the times that they were making these bloody sacrifices. And so there they were to cleanse them themselves, being made ceremonially holy. And it's a picture of Christ cleansing his people. And it's a beautiful picture when you put the two pieces of furniture together. Um, we are not through once we've gone to the brazen altar and we've received forgiveness of our sins. 
We still need the laver, the laver for the daily cleansing that brings about restoration and joy of the full fellowship of God, spoken of in John 13, 10, where Jesus was speaking of washing one another's feet. He said, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash, like they don't need an entire bath, except for the feet to be entirely clean. And that idea is that we continue to walk in this world and we continue to sin. And so we confess our sins to God and we're cleansed again. And so the idea of is the labor, we can symbolize that is that daily repentance and um, cleansing of sin that we have. Positionally, in heaven, we have been made holy. The purchase price has been paid for our holiness. But while we're here, we continue to receive forgiveness for our sins through confession and repentance. Okay, so we come to the skin-covered building that was divided into two rooms uh, separated by a thick curtain. Now, no everyday Israelite was allowed to enter these rooms. Only Levitical priests could enter these rooms. No ordinary priest could enter the second room or um, the holy place, the holy of holies. Uh, that was just for the high priest alone once a year. Well, the first room again is called the holy place and it contained the lamps, the golden lampstand, we often call a menorah, uh, the showbread table, and the golden altar of incense. So let's talk about the golden lampstand. The seven lit golden lampstand was made of pure gold. No dimensions are given, but its total weight was at least one talent or 75 pounds or more of solid gold. By the way, the closer you got to the inner sanctuary of the Holy of Holies, the more the furnishings were covered with gold symbolizing deity and holiness. The lampstand was hammered. You've got one piece of gold, just one big piece of gold. Think about that, 75 pounds or more. And it was hammered and it was fashioned into the shape of a tree. Um, and then the lamp base, the base, the bottom portion of it, and the center shaft that came up um, made up the trunk and then there were branches on each side. Um, so that was a, just a beautiful piece. Oh my goodness, that had to have been gorgeous. Now, that there were uh, three branches, by the way, on each side. So there's six all together. The Jews believe that the lampstand or the menorah represents the people of God, God's light to the nations, which I think is a great symbolism. Many Christians view it as the oneness of Christ and his church. Six branches being the number of men and the shaft being seven, uh, which is the number of completion. So man is only complete in Christ. Colossians 2.10 says, So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. We are complete in Christ. The top of the shaft and the branches were designed like open almond flowers. The fruitfulness of the almond tree is mentioned in scripture, and it was the first to blossom and bear fruit in the spring as early as January and February. Some believe that the lampstand echoed the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, which is you can read about in Genesis 2.9. God gave Adam um, and Eve the tree of life to show that he was their source of life. But when they sinned through disobedience, they were cut off from the tree of life. Even still, God had a plan to reconcile his people and give them new life in his son, Jesus Christ. That new life, like, uh, like the almond buds, blooming in springtime. So that's a great symbolism. Each almond flower held an oil lamp filled with pure olive oil, which was lit. The lamp was attended by Aaron and his sons and was to never go out because the holy chamber had no windows. It was the only source of light, just as Jesus is the only source of light to the believer. Christians shall not walk in darkness, spiritual darkness ever again because of Christ. John 18, 12 says, Jesus is the light of life for all those who follow him. 
First Peter 2, 9 adds, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That was the candlestick. And now we're going to go on to the showbread table. That's what you would see next. This was made of acacia wood, again, overlaid with gold. It was three feet long and one and a half feet wide and about two and a quarter feet off the ground. And on it, every Sabbath, a priest would bring 12 loaves, uh, one for each tribe of Israel, six um, in two rows, a row of six here, a row of six of, of there of the Sabbath bread. And uh, only, they were only allowed to eat it. Only the uh, priests were allowed to eat this bread. Now, next would be the golden altar of incense. It too was made of acacia wood in uh, covered in gold. It was one and a half feet square and three feet high. Now from the altar of incense, um, it would be placed before the veil and separated uh, the holy place from the holy of holies. It was right before it. Aaron was instructed to burn incense on that altar each morning and at twilight every day as the regular offering to the Lord. And God gave the recipe for making this incense and stipulated that no other incense burn on this altar. The fire um, used to burn the incense was always taken from the brazen altar. In verse 4, the writer places the altar of incense within the second room the most holy place or the holy of holies because it was closely associated with the worship of, um, of the Ark of the Covenant and its mercies. But uh, the placement was actually in that first room, the tabernacle pro proper or the holy place. That's where it was situated each and every time. The Ark of the Covenant stood alone behind the second curtain. Well, let's talk about that most holy place, the Holy of Holies. That was the last room within the tabernacle, and it contained the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark represented the dwelling place of God. The visual Shekinah glory of God, or a glowing light, rested between the cherubim atop the mercy seat. The Ark represents Jesus Christ, who was the true mercy seat. Through Christ, we find mercy we are no longer going to be in judgment for our sins. That judgment passes over us because he took it in his own body. That is a wonderful mercy seat. Um, when you meet Jesus as Christ as your Savior, he, he also ushers you into the presence of God. We now have accessibility to the presence of God because of Jesus. So that ark in many ways besides these two represent Jesus. Now within the ark were Israel's most treasured possessions. The jar of manna, which never spoiled, Aaron's staff that budded or sprouted and presented fruit when Aaron's priesthood was challenged by the heads of other tribes, and the actual um, tablets of the law that were given to Moses, brought down from the mountain, written by the finger of God. I hope these visuals, um, these descriptions, and some of these symbolisms of the tabernacle and its furnishings give you um, just a taste of how they speak of Jesus and proclaim his gospel. Now we're going to go to part two, which is the service of the Levitical high priest. Verses six and seven, let's read those. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part of the, the, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed by ignorance. All right, the services. Now the author wants to make a point about the tabernacle services. The priest entered um, the holy place every day to trim the oil on the lampstand, to put incense um, on the altar to change the 12 loaves every day every day they did these services and annually the high priest must take with him a basin of blood from a goat that had been sacrificed and sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat for his own sins and for the sins of the people and he did this every year year after year on the day of atonement or Yom Kippur 
these repetitious sacrifices were meant to reveal that the Arianic priesthood was was never able to accomplish anything permanently, any permanent covering of sin or forgiveness of sin. The perfect sacrifice was yet to come. However, it could not be apprehended while relying on the old way of accessing God. It had to the old way had to come to an end. Verse 7 says he offered the sacrifice for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So let's grasp this. God had a relationship with Israel, but what happened to that connection every time the people sinned? Well, it was broken. So every day they had the opportunity to make animal sacrifices at the brazen altar for forgiveness. If you knew you had sinned, you could take care of it right away by bringing in an appropriate sacrifice. And these sacrifices were a form of reconnecting to God for Israel. And the priests would help you with that process. But what was done for the sins that, and the mistakes, you know, the errors that you make throughout the year that are unconfessed or unnoticed or unacknowledged, we all have them. They all had them. What about those errors you weren't aware of that you didn't even realize you had committed in ignorance? You didn't even know that was wrong or a sin. You just weren't aware of it or you forgot about it or you never dealt with it. And then you're left defiled. Well, here is where the high priest served. All of those sins of the whole nation of Israel that were not dealt with with direct sacrifice In essence, they would be gathered together and covered by the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement in the most holy place. As you can imagine, this was a day of rejoicing and forgiveness and liberty and cleansing of the conscience. It it was a special day for the people of Israel. Now, in this respect, Jesus' work is far more excellent than the work done in the Day of Atonement because Jesus' work on the cross was sufficient to atone for both the sins that you were aware of and the sins you committed in ignorance. Now, the old covenant was symbolic. The old covenant was symbolic. This is part three, verses eight through 10. Let's read that. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time um, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regarding to in regard to the conscience. Verse 10, concerning only with food and drink, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. I want to read verse 8 in the New Living Translation. Verse 8. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. So the Holy Spirit is teaching several things here. Foremost, that the old system was inadequate and limited. In what way? In what way? Well, there was no access to the holy place or the most, you know, the holiest of holies, for the people. The most holy place was not freely open. Only the priest or the high priest were allowed to enter there. And even then, it wasn't for real fellowship. And then also, what did the most holy place represent? Well, it represented heaven. So there was no access to heaven through the sacrifices. These are important points that the Holy Spirit's making. Now you may ask, are you saying that no Jew went to, no Jew in the Old Testament ever went to heaven? And I've been wanting to talk about this, and so now is my opportunity. No, they did go to heaven, not because of the Judaistic system. Um, they went to heaven because of Christ's death. When the Old Testament saints died, uh, those believing saints, they went to a place called Sheol. And it wasn't until Jesus died that Sheol, um, he went to gather together those Old Testament saints and bring them to heaven. The scriptures tell us that Jesus died and then he descended into the lower parts of the earth and he led captivity captive and he brought them into God's presence. That's the first time that they could have full access to God. 
And it was made possible because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice, his perfect priesthood, and his perfect covenant. Now, verse 9 in the New Living Translation. This is an illustration pointing to the present time, for the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. So this is an illustration, or the word symbolic. This is symbolic. And that word symbolic is the word parable. It means to place side by side lessons. Um, you know, and so these lessons and these comparisons um, were about the tabernacle and its sacrifices and offerings. Those sacrifices and offerings actually had built-in lessons about how impermanent they were showing it was limited by the fact that you had to repeat them over and over, showed that they were limited and that they were impermanent. They would not last to cover your sins. They would not bring true forgiveness. So it was imperfect and they were temporary because it could only temporarily cleanse a person's conscience. Place side by side the sacrifices of Christ that offered eternal forgiveness uh, proved that the Levitical ceremonies fell short. That was the symbolism that's speaking of here. And then in verse 10, concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. The old uh, covenant ceremonies were needed for their time, but only until the reformation could establish a better system. That better system is the new covenant in Christ. Verses 11 through 14, Christ has come. Let's read that, 11 through 14. But Christ uh, came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Oh, what an appeal the author and the Holy Spirit make to the Hebrew believers and any who were having doubts. He gives comparisons, uh, beginning with the new versus the old. It says in verse 11, But Christ came as high priest of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Jesus Christ is the high priest of a greater, more perfect tabernacle. What is this greater and more perfect tabernacle? Oh, well, it's heaven. Where does Christ minister for us right now? in the throne room of heaven at the right hand of the Father. Let me tell you something that's amazing. We all who believe in Christ are seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. This is the position that we have in Christ. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 say, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Alive spiritually, seated with Christ. This is the present position of every believer. He's purchased for us resurrection and the privilege to sit in the throne room of heaven with him. This is powerful stuff. And then verse 12, not with animal sacrifices, but with his own blood, he entered the Holy of Holies, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So here's the comparison. His own blood versus animal's blood. One sacrifice versus ongoing years worth of sacrifices. Eternal redemption versus one that's impermanent. It's concerning redemption. Galatians 3.13 says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. He became the curse for us. 
And he is what has made it possible for us to overcome and receive salvation. The law could not do that for us, but Jesus did. He redeemed us. And then concerning that eternal thing, that eternal work he does, his redemption is eternal and it will continue forever. It will cover us forever of our sins. It's not a temporary deliverance, leaving God's people in a place of danger of falling into sin or ruination of any kind. It makes our salvation secure eternally. And then Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying the flesh, David Grusick wrote this, the ashes of a heifer referred to the remains of a burnt offering that was preserved. The ashes were sprinkled in the laver of washing to provide water suitable for a ceremonial cleansing. I thought it would be great to point that out because most of us might not know that. Verse 13 contains old ceremonial sacrifices that temporarily cleanse the conscience of sin. They are compared to the blood of Christ. In verse 14, where it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Keeping the law cannot cleanse our sin, therefore it leads to death. So keeping the law is dead works. Dead works, worthless dead works. But Christ, because of his perfect holiness, can thoroughly wash our sin. He makes it possible to leave behind the law, leave it behind, and all of its dead works. To remain in Keeping the law after the new covenant of Christ is to just offer dead works. They're meaningless. But now we're able to move on and to serve the living God. In the Old Testament, only kings and priests and prophets could serve Jehovah. But through Christ's sacrifice, we have been consecrated into his service. When we choose to follow Jesus and we forsake worthless idols, worthless dead idols, um, and, and we used to think that they were so worth living for, but now instead we put those things behind us and we serve the living God. Isn't that the proper response to the sacrifice of Jesus and all the goodness of the new covenant to worship him and to serve him all the days and years of our life? Yes, yes and amen it is. And that is what all of these things wrap up into is it? Oh, since he's done some marvelous, loving work on our behalf, let's live for him. Let's make the most of our life for his glory. Let's look at him to to see how can we make his name great? How can we please him? How can we reveal to others who he truly is? Since he's revealed himself to us, we must move on to good works to bless the world around us and really become a light. So let's pray for that. Father, you've given us a covenant, the most beautiful covenant of love, where we could be completely and eternally forgiven. And it is just the most beautiful thing. It's the best part of our life, God. I thank you that we can put off all the worthless idols that we used to worship, that we made important. We can leave behind the law and trying to keep all the rules and regulations, and we can just walk in a living relationship with a living God. And Lord, now that we've received these beautiful promises, now that we've received your son, we pray that our lives would be consecrated and set apart for your glory. We pray that we could serve you with all of our hearts. We could find our purpose in this world to make your name great, (laughs) to share with the world that you're alive and that you love them. Because we've received so much, I pray that you empower us to give so much back to this world and lead others to you and all the ways that you call us to serve us, anoint us and use us, especially in these last days to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ah, thank you for being with me today. God bless you as you follow and serve our Lord Jesus Christ. See you next time. Bye.